Good morning, my name is Adrian Park and along with my uh, co-directors Dr. Phil Schauer and Dr. Steve Wexner, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this month's uh, program in Innovations in Surgery. Uh, I'd also just like to very briefly uh, run through those in attendance and uh, as always we'll, uh, we'll uh, remind everybody that um, these programs are, are most edifying to all involved when there's good uh, engagement and interactivity and so we'll encourage comments and questions. If you don't hear your center name, please let the folks at Course Call know uh, to let me know. So Carolinas Medical Center, Cleveland Clinic, Maine, Cleveland Clinic, Weston, Dalhousie University in Halifax, um, the Geisinger Clinic, Imperial College in London, Indiana University North, Johns Hopkins, McGill University in Montreal, Minnesota Institute of MIS, Mount Sinai Medical Center, Ohio State University, Centara Lee Hospital, uh, Summa Health System, Virginia Commonwealth uh, Medical Center, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, and Winthrop University. Uh, this morning we have a subject uh, that we're going to be discussing that uh, pertains really to all uh, abdominal surgeons and that would uh, in some way, I think, cover all uh, attendees to this um, uh, broadcast this morning. Uh, Dr. Uh, Igor Belyinsky here uh, from Anne Arundel Medical Center in Annapolis is going to be uh, discussing abdominal wall reconstruction, what is meaningful abdominal wall function, how to best restore it. Dr. Belyinsky. Thank you for the honor to be here this morning and to present on it about really a, a topic near and dear to my heart. Uh, again, the title of my talk is Abdominal Wall Reconstruction, What is Meaningful Abdominal Wall Function, How Best to Restore It. As I uh, go through the next uh, uh, slides, what I'd like to cover is to identify the patients with the complex abdominal wall defects, to review the functional abdominal wall, to understand the impact of chronic defects on abdominal wall function, and to understand the techniques for reconstructing abdominal wall. At the end, I'd like to review the quality of life and the functional outcomes uh, whatever limited data we have right now on the topic. One thing I want to mention, I did do my fellowship at Carolina's Medical Center. Uh, while I was there, I had the opportunity to look at the case volume of uh, uh, the four busy hernia surgeons in the center. All of them are uh, being invasive, trained, and very comfortable with technique. Interesting enough, uh, majority of them, uh, over half the cases went down to an open approach uh, versus laparoscopic approach uh, when it came to open uh, when it came to ventral hernias. And part of the reason is as uh, Carolina says that uh, uh, tertiary referral center and what we saw is uh, patients from really all walks of life with this uh, fairly complex abdominal wall defects. Uh, for one reason or another, uh, at some point in their life they went through some kind of intra-abdominal catastrophe that uh, resulted in this debilitating defect. Uh, when considering uh, abdominal wall defects, uh, abdominal wall defects, uh, there's certain uh, clinical considerations that need to be made. Uh, most of those patients have loss of abdominal domain, uh, as their muscles, or compartment muscles, retract laterally, they lose their function. A lot of them are more bleed these patients and have significant pain, or scarring, skin thinning, skin ulceration, and body disfigurement. Uh, the goal of abdominal wall reconstruction is, uh, is not only to decrease occurrence rate. But now it's uh, becoming more evident that improving quality of life and restoring abdominal wall functionality is uh, just as important. It's, uh, to, uh, to address the functionality, I think uh, you really need to understand the, uh, the functionality of abdominal wall and uh, really the purpose of abdominal wall muscles and what role they play uh, in the breathing, uh, flexing, uh, turning, uh, provide stability of the spine. As you all know, the anterior abdominal wall uh, consists of rectus abdominis, external oblique, internal oblique, and transversalis abdominis muscles. Together, they, can, uh, they make the core muscle and balance, uh, balance out the uh, uh, muscles of the back. There are several studies that are looking at the issue. Uh, the, the one that, uh, 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 done by Detroit, uh, published in the Journal of Applied Physiology in 1990, uh, looked at six healthy volunteers, and they used a high-resolution ultrasound to make uh, electric uh, readings. Uh, the first slide uh, looks at the uh, activities of uh, trunk rotation and head flexion. You see with uh, trunk rotation, you see a uh, significant, uh, sig uh, significant response for external oblique muscles, and not as much response for rectus abdominis and transversalis abdominis. With head flexion on the other side, you get the uh, rectus abdominis response, but not as much from external oblique and transversalis abdominis. 
Uh, the authors also looked at respiration, uh, voluntary expiration, and forced expiration, and they saw actually contribution from all the abdominal wall muscles. As you see here in the graph, this is a, a pleural pressure here, and uh, abdominal uh, diameter uh, anterior to posterior. As the ex uh, expiration uh, initiates, the uh, diameter decreases, and all the muscles uh, actually participate in expiration. But of course, uh, initially, it actually, they, when they saw the chest muscles of Dallas was the initial muscle that uh, was recruited. And uh, of course, expiration, all the muscles contribute equally. Well, the interesting thing, they also looked at the uh, state of hypercapnia, and what they found interesting enough that transversal of Dallas was the main muscle contributing to uh, uh, to breathing, and uh, there's no recruitment in the rectus of Dallas or external oblique. Uh, thus concluding that this abdominal muscle is recruited preferentially to the superior muscle layer of the abdominal wall during breathing, and the threshold for abdominal wall muscles during expiration is substantially lower than conventionally thought. So again, this study emphasized that uh, there's much uh, more importance to uh, abdominal, wall compart uh, abdominal wall muscles in breathing than I initially thought. What about spinal stability? Uh, Bergman uh, looked at uh, rectus abdominis, external abdominis, and internal abdominis muscles, and uh, they identified that it produced flexion, lateral fixation, lateral flexion, and rotation movements. And this way controlled the external forces that cause a spine to extend laterally, flex, and rotate. Transverse abdominal muscle provides longer pelvic stability. So with all of that in mind, now what happens when a patient develops a hernia? Uh, the reefs, uh, uh, reefs postulated that abdominal wall loses synergy with diaphragm and bowels are forced out with respirations. Uh, as a result, back muscles are not counterbalanced and the patient develops lordosis and back pain. Lateral muscles retract, becoming fatty and fibrous, and there are also dermatologic changes as giving ulcers of the skin. Whereas, uh, so th this is kind of underlined in a study by Debay, an analysis of surgery published in 2007. And what they did, they looked at uh, 21 mice, uh, I'm sorry, 21 rats, and they divided them in three groups, the uninjured group and the uh, heel group or sham group, where they uh, made an incision linear alba and they closed uh, the incision afterwards, um, and the hernia group where they left the fascia open. So they followed those rats for 35 days, and what they did afterwards, they euthanized them, uh, they harvested the internal oblique muscle, and they uh, provided, uh, they did perform a variety of tests, including the histology, and so that uh, the hernia group actually had more fibrosis uh, in the muscle, and as well as the, uh, they performed the salometry test, uh, seeing that the uh, the internal oblique muscle was more stiff and actually <clears throat> and actually had decreased compliance. Thus, they concluded that the internal oblique muscle uh, during herniation becomes fibrotic, reduces abdominal wall compliance, and increases load transfer to the midline wood at the time of repair. So when you try to repair a chronic hernia patient, what happens is you try to bring together uh, this uh, quote-unquote fibrotic muscles, and that does provide more load uh, transfer that uh, midline closure. So that they postulate that this is one of the reasons the hernia repairs may fail. All right, well, let's just uh, uh, pause for a sec. Um, uh, hearing a little bit of background in terms of um, uh, what, how, how abdominal wall function um, is, is constituted, let's try going to all the way up to uh, uh, Halifax <clears throat> and Dalhousie University, and uh, I'm not sure who we've got uh, in the room this morning, but um, if we've got Dr. Elsmere, Dr. Klassen, um, can you tell us a little bit about what what you guys do or what your center <clears throat> approach might be to bringing in um, a consideration of, of, the, of the functional activities, the activities of daily living of your patients in terms of uh, choosing a, a, a treatment course for the hernia? Thank you. It's uh, Dennis Claussen here. This is an excellent topic, by the way, very uh, important one and current. Um, I think one has to individualize the approach, and I often teach residents by using a few anecdotes. If you have a young female trauma patient in the ICU, a number of weeks, open belly, the manner in which you reconstruct your abdominal wall will be much different than the 70-year-old person with multiple midline defects from an aortic aneurysm repair. So that 70-year-old rather sedentary, possibly or probably obese person, abdominal wall function isn't so important as just preventing further problems. Whereas that young patient, you'd be much more aggressive about things like 
uh, component separation, reconstruction, reapproximation of the rectus, perhaps even avoidance of any permanent prosthesis, considering the fact she may one day uh, bear some children. So that's how I often frame the discussion. And then, of course, there's everyone in between. So there's certainly no absolutes here. I think it has to be customized and individualized to each patient in their uh, clinical scenario. All right, thanks, uh, thanks, Dennis. So did I hear that I hear that you're more inclined to do separation of components with uh, your younger patients than the older ones? Yeah, because younger, more functional people, more likely to do that, and more likely to use an absorbable, either polymer or biologic mesh. Elderly sedentary patients, I don't have a lot of optimism if I restore their abdominal walls to their anatomic original position that that's going to do them any good and potentially or perhaps probably do them more harm than if I just laparoscopically place a large mesh prosthesis. Okay, thanks. Thank you for your comments. Let, let's go to our uh, friends at Walter Reed um, National Military uh, Medical Center. Um, you have, uh, not always, but sometimes a, a, a younger patient population um, uh, and folks that, uh, whose level of activity might be different than the average patient we'd see in terms of restoring activity. I'm not sure who we have there that could respond to, uh, to the question, but how, if there's a center approach or an individual uh, approach to um, taking into consideration the patient's level of function and the level of function they're to return to in terms of crafting their, their hernia care. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Craig Shriver here at uh, Walter Reed Bethesda, Scott Rare, and uh, a bunch of uh, our residents and faculty here. Uh, you know, since 2001, when uh, Iraq and Afghanistan uh, wars are continuing over the last 10 years, our main problem with uh, this very interesting topic has been young men, mostly, 95% of the casualties, <clears throat> with coming in with open abdomens and early in the war there was a lot of volume resuscitation uh, devastating uh, extremity injuries uh, multiple amputations so we were receiving dozens of patients uh, two and three days off the battlefield with uh, big open abdomens uh, total uh, evisceration of uh, abdominal contents and so our initial goals in those patients was stabilization of uh, the lateral movement of uh, the midline uh, rectus uh, incision uh, we would put in a, uh, a bio, or I'm sorry, a Gore-Tex uh, uh, mesh just to prevent further lateralization of that, maintain abdominal uh, integrity, prevent volume and fluid loss. And then over time, uh, as the days would uh, unfold, we did almost uh, like you do in pediatric patients with an omphalocele, a serial abdominal closure. And we've described this uh, process and uh, procedure in uh, multiple publications, including in JAX's. Um, and we were able to get uh, reapproximation of midline fascia in a large percentage of those patients and to get all of them within four centimeters of separation after about two weeks of this uh, basically serial abdominal closure approach, which is again uh, akin to a pediatric omphalocele uh, uh, case of silo. Um, and then we would put a, a final uh, prosthesis in uh, usually uh, polypropylene at that time. Since that time, that was for the first five or six years, we've gone to, as the, our plastic surgeons have become more expert in the components part separation, uh, the final stage of it, uh, we now perform components part separation to avoid uh, placement of, uh, of uh, permanent prosthesis uh, when possible. Again, the issue with these young men is to maintain abdominal integrity and function, as the speaker is pointing out, because they all have additional other injuries, multiple amputations, they've got to get up on their prostheses, They've got to start their rehab, uh, get some of the function uh, back, and if they don't have core muscle integrity, uh, that is a big problem for them. So that's been our approach, and we've published on that. But more recently, we do uh, go with the component part separation to avoid uh, permanent prosthesis. Thank you very much. Those are uh, very uh, helpful comments, uh, providing insight that most of us uh, um, wouldn't have based on our, our patient population. And, um, so thank you very much. And I'll remind uh, everybody there should be a number that comes up on the bottom of your screen if you would like to call in with a question or, or, or add a comment to the discussion. Okay, let's return to Dr. Uh, Belyansky now. So, uh, so the next, uh, next few slides what I'm going to be talking about is uh, actually the technical aspects of dental work construction as well as you know, what to do with a patient the first time you see them in the office. And uh, I think uh, abdominal work construction is really kind of a blanket statement of uh, 
uh, really, uh, it includes a lot of different procedures. It's, uh, the, some of the commentator, commentators already mentioned uh, component separation. I really don't think uh, uh, component separation is a gold standard, but really uh, what you uh, want to do uh, during this uh, constructive purpose, you want to get uh, typically the midline fascia back together and repair the hernia so it doesn't come back. So what happens when in the in the initial office visit? Obviously, you do a history and physical. I think uh, anyone who does a double reconstruction, they know it's a, a fairly uh, aggressive procedure and very invasive. Uh, so you, I think it's very important to assess mobility to the patients. Is the patient able to uh, be able to tolerate surgery? Now, typically, before my patients come to see me, I, uh, I usually already have CT scans, and the day before the surgery, I can review CT scan and kind of make my plan what I'm going to do. So this is a patient uh, whom I saw a couple of months ago, and as you see, he has uh, some loss of abdominal domain, some skin thinning, and uh, uh, you know his uh, uh, his uh, hernia sac or hernia is essentially hanging off on top of his uh, pubic bone. Well, uh, you know I have a plan in my mind what I'm going to do with this gentleman. Now when I walk into him, uh, meet him, he is in a wheelchair bound. He has uh, debilitating rheumatoid arthritis. He just had a recent MI, and his hernia is completely asymptomatic. So again, uh, obviously this patient, I'm not going to go and uh, put through. Uh, downward construction, this major procedure, which uh, has high morbidity associated with it. So I think it's really important to get to know your patients. Now, the first visit I usually ask is, uh, you know, what are the patient's goals? I try to find out more about what their status was before they actually uh, developed the hernia defect. You know, what do they hope this surgery will accomplish for them? You know, you guys uh, have realistic goals and expectations for the patients. So uh, then, uh, you know, then I usually typically see them two or three times afterwards, and the, uh, typically it's a process of uh, about three to four months. Uh, majority of my patients uh, are morbidly obese patients, uh, and I think uh, uh, considering also the fact that they have a significant loss of down, the, uh, the main weight loss is a big issue. Uh, typically I have my patients lose about 20 to 40 pounds before actually talking about surgery. Uh, quitting smoking is extremely important. I will not operate in the patient if they're a smoker. Uh, we've shown this before. Uh, smoking is a big uh, risk factor for wound complications, hernia occurrence. Uh, they have to quit eight to six weeks before the surgery, and I ask them not to smoke for at least eight to ten weeks after the surgery. All of them get preoperative CT scan. Again, uh, those are complex patients. The CT scan helps me evaluate the abdominal wall before the surgery, as well as uh, helps me rule out any surprises that I would like to find properly. Uh, you know, I think it's important to mention, depending on the age of patient, if a patient is over 50, uh, it's important to have a screening colonoscopy. You do one uh, major procedure with them, you probably don't want to be coming back in their belly afterwards. And once they reach those certain preoperative goals, that's when you start talking about surgery. And uh, I think as a surgeon, uh, then you have to consider certain uh, technical considerations. And again, majority of our patients are morbidly obese patients. Uh, and the, the question is, uh, do they need a the penicillin beforehand? Uh, there's definitely uh, some problems with hygiene, and uh, if you're leaving pants with behind. Um, I think we'll go through, and there's some data out there that uh, uh, penicillectomy does decrease wound complication. That being said, it's still a morbid procedure. I think good rule of thumb is a hernia that involves the pannus, uh, the pannus is going to go. Uh, again, another question is there also major abdominal domain? Uh, the, the, the you know, component separation was already mentioned. Uh, can the bead line uh, be brought back together? You know, I've been actually surprised, and I'll talk about it. That, uh, soon, I've been actually surprised recently when I got my patients to lose weight, I didn't have to do, uh, be as aggressive about component separation as I, I, as I thought I was going to be before the surgery. Is the presence of old mesh that will need to be excised? Now, one thing is to consider is if there's mesh uh, that's intimately associated with bowel or that's uh, actually fistulizing the bowel, th that case just becomes much harder and much more difficult. I think those, are, uh, those uh, cases are some of the more challenging cases that and even a more challenging than a large hernia is with uh, loss of the name. Need a valor section and decision of what type of mesh to use. Uh, there's a variety of meshes out there, synthetic, biologic, bioabsorbable. And uh, you know, I'm not going to, for purposes of time, I can be talking about this for the next two hours, but uh, and we're not going to talk about the types of mesh. Uh, I do think mesh is important to use uh, in abdominal wall construction, though. Uh, and I think I want to quote that. Uh, uh, when a stopa simply suturing even without tension, the deep musculofascial layer of the abdominal wall is not sufficient to repair hernia. Uh, we do have level one evidence. Uh, uh, the Lewin-Dyke study from 2000, looking at uh, 200 patients uh, at the multi site trial, dramatically showed decrease of uh, incisional hernia recurrence after use of mesh. So I actually uh, do use mesh, whether biologic or biabsorbable or synthetic. I do use mesh every time in all of my cases uh, without hesitation. Uh, whether they're young patients or uh, older patients.
Uh, where to place the mesh? Uh, again, uh, one of the things you can do, you can do an all-layer pair, you can do a rectus repair. Uh, what I do is uh, what Yuri Nowitzki and Hanford was, uh, described, uh, group described in 2006, uh, I place it in the pre-critineal uh, space. Uh, this is really kind of an extension of uh, reef stop repair that described in 1989, and I think a lot of things we do in surgery, we kind of take what somebody else has, uh, has kind of contributed, and we uh, make it a little bit, I think, better. So uh, let's talk about how to develop pre your space. So this is uh, intra-abdominal, uh, uh, this is intra picture of somebody who already had an neglected major abdominal uh, hernia, uh, for the first thing you do with your life to heal is reducing from down uh, kind of back at w where they belong. And then uh, the easiest way to do, uh, uh, to do uh, actually to kill the peritoneum is actually to get the space of rinses to take the bladder down and then perform lateral dissection. Now I'll just uh, help you create that pre peritoneal flap. Uh, then you go superiorly, you take the phosphor ligament down and then once you have all the edges of pre peritoneal flap, then it's ready to be closed. Uh, this is a picture of a closed peritoneum. You, know, you can use a, a tool or a micro suture to close the peritoneum. And uh, the beautiful thing about that, uh, once you close the peritoneum, the valves are out of play, and really, uh, the surgery just became much easier. The rest, I think, is uh, more, you know, we're constructing that down wall is much easier than uh, the quarters. So what is the uh, uh, benefits of a peritoneal hernia repair? It allows dramatic overlap. The intestines are out of play. It allows you coverage of difficult defects uh, for pal iliac, the subcostal, subpubic defects. Uh, essentially, the space that you create is from the pubic bone to a zyper process from mid axial line to mid axial line. So, uh, how do you bring the uh, fascia back together? Uh, there's a, a variety of, of uh, different ways to do, uh, to do component separation. I think uh, uh, Ramirez was the first one in 1990 to describe the bilateral posterior rectal sheath release. And, uh, external oblique release. That's uh, what I do in my practice right now. Typically, uh, you know, what I'll do is I'll have, a, we'll place uh, two copper clamps on each uh, edge of the fascia and might have myself and my assistant uh, pull the edges of the fascia back together. Now, if there's a lot of tension, the first thing I'll do is I'll start with a posterior rectus sheath release. Each posterior rectus sheath can give you up to four centimeters of mobilization immediately. And typically, uh, if that's enough, you know, it will be done right there. If uh, there's still some tension, I'll release one of the external obliques and see if there's still tension, I'll release the second external oblique. And I'm trying to be as conservative as possible with component separation otherwise. I'll do whatever needs to happen. So here's a, a case report. Uh, uh, this is a, just a recent case of mine, uh, a 65-year-old female with history of Crohn's disease. Uh, uh, unfortunately, had a perforation that had the ileocecectomy. Uh, Postoperatively developed uh, wound complication, and this is her three and a half years later was uh, fairly large uh, incisional hernia. This is her pre-upper CT scan. You can appreciate the loss of the main, the lateral mobilization of rectus abdominis muscles. The defect size uh, is approximately 25 centimeters in diameter. Um, so again, what do you do with her? So before you know, see her office, you know, we got her to lose about 30 pounds. You know, she was not a smoker and then we post her case. Again, uh, her pants was involving her uh, hernia. So for that reason, I did perform a pneumocolectomy in her. And then again, last adhesions uh, took down the uh, uh, peritoneum, and then the, this is what peritoneum looks close. And again, you can appreciate the very large peritoneal space that's developed, uh, that's raised for the mesh. The mesh, this is actually a 50 by the image of a 50 by 50 centimeter mesh in here. The mesh is secured uh, to the pubic bone uh, with two uh, stitches. You'll need a lot of stitches to secure the mesh uh, because, again, the valves are out play and uh, it's protected by peritoneum. Uh, then you just uh, secure it with one, with one or two stitches in subzyper process, or, or one, uh, between two and three stitches on uh, each side. Uh, again, in the right uh, uh, corner here, you see her abdomen open with peritoneal dissection, and this is where her midline fascia looks closed. And her actually had to perform bilateral posterior rectus sheath release and bilateral external oblique releases. And you see a very nice mobilization of fascia medially. One thing I want to say, in this particular patient, she did have some thinning of internal oblique and trivisalis muscles. And in her case, uh, what I did, then I just uh, overlapped the mesh from the inside. And with, with this little arrows are pointing, are pointing to the points where uh, the trans, uh, transfascial suture fixation of the mesh at lateral sides. And you can see kind of it provides the extra stability and so uh, potentially preventing kind of pseudo herniation that has been reported out there uh, after component separation. So the before and after pictures are always very nice. And the advantages of downward construction is that it does maintain dynamic abdomen. It does give you cosmetic results. You know, somebody mentioned that doing component separation without uh, 
uh, without mesh repair, you know, maybe in healthy patients, younger patients, it might be different, but in my patient population, it is associated with 40 to 50 percent uh, hernia recurrence rate without mesh use. Um, always use mesh, and they, I'll show you later that the hernia, the rate of recurrence is about 3 to 4.5 percent uh, with this technique. All right, thanks, Igor. That's a, a lot of stuff to be thinking about and talking about. Let's go to uh, Cleveland Clinic, Maine, uh, for a sec. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about patient uh, preparation here, and um, I believe you're in the room. Um, you and I have actually differed uh, uh, in hernia meetings uh, before about this subject of is it possible for hernia patients to um, uh, uh, have weight loss or to be um, to lose weight prior to surgery without bariatric surgery. Um, so here Igor is telling us that this is a part of his regular uh, routine and very important. He maybe can even avoid separation components if you do this. What would you say to that? And uh, anybody uh, who can achieve some weight loss uh, by non-surgical means, you know, prior to any intervention, lots of obvious health benefits. Um, I think the problem is, and what I'd love to see is longer-term data, because I suspect that over time, most of these folks will regain their weight, and I wonder if that uh, contributes to a higher rate of recurrence, you know, long-term. Um, secondly, you know, most uh, non-surgical weight loss interventions have a limited uh, effect in terms of the magnitude of weight loss. Uh, it's, it's very uncommon to get more than 10% of body weight loss uh, with a non um, you know, non-surgical uh, approach. But I recognize there are some patients that uh, are unwilling or un unable to have bariatric surgery. But my plea would be for all of the surgeons out there doing these complex hernia surgeries, particularly in the severely obese, you know, to consider a bariatric procedure, you know, prior to, um, you know, a large abdominal wall reconstruction. And maybe a sleeve gastrectomy, which is a lower, less invasive approach, uh, may be the ideal option. Thanks, Phil. Um, Igor, any, any response to that? Uh, do you have any sense of uh, does weight loss or weight gain happen afterwards? And, and how many of these patients would be amenable to a concomitant or a pre-hernia repair bariatric procedure? I think it's a wonderful idea to have a bariatric surgery beforehand. Uh, just that, uh, first of all, I'm not sure how realistic some of the, uh, you know, some of this is. And, uh, it, uh, we can probably send you some of our patients over there if, if you want to tackle some of them. But once you, it's, it's, a lot of them, it's very difficult to get in the abdomen. And once you're there, you might as well just uh, fix the defect, in my opinion. Uh, they're very challenging uh, patients. Uh, and a lot of them had uh, previous uh, thin hernia repairs. Uh, there's essentially, uh, you know, I remember one particular patient, five layers of mesh that you have to go through, uh, and then the mesh incomplete associated with bowel. It's really, you know, it's apparently difficult to uh, get that. Uh, to the stomach to do a sleep gastrectomy laparoscopy. I've talked, actually, it's a very interesting topic. I've talked to my partner who is a bariatric surgeon, and we've talked about, you know, doing a sleep gastrectomy with several patients. But uh, still, I think uh, uh, you, you have to be very selective, uh, probably, about, uh, you know, th their history, the previous surgical history might limit you from uh, actually doing a bariatric procedure on them. So it's a difficult problem. I think uh, it, it is a great thing, uh, probably long-term, as far as weight loss, uh, it would uh, definitely prevent them. I think weight loss and uh, morbidity is one of the things that kind of increases the chronic intraabdominal pressure, resulting in uh, um, uh, resulting in the hernia recurrence. So that's definitely one of the contributing factors. Thanks, Igor. All right. Phil had a response or not? Did you have another response, Phil? Or you know, respond that um, you know, obviously, you know, doing a gastric bypass, we have to access the mid gut and actually do a. You know, two anastomoses, I get it, it's much more challenging. But a lot of these folks, and that's been our experience, uh, you can get, you know, up high uh, and do a sleeve gastrectomy um, and stay away from you know, these you know, massive, you know, mid to lower abdominal hernia defects and achieve, you know, 100 plus pound weight loss and set you up very nicely uh, to have this thing done at a, at a second time. So something to consider. Thanks, so well, let's go to our colleagues at Imperial College uh, in London, and my question to you is, uh, what's the, uh, the culture of practice where you are in terms of expectations of, of patients uh, uh, quitting smoking or losing weight, uh, or which, which patients may or, not, may, or not, may or may not actually be candidates for surgery? Um, 
Hi, hi, hi everyone. Um, we've got a room filled with residents and fellows, and uh, unfortunately we don't have anyone uh, from the bariatric service, so uh, I, I can't comment on that in terms of what kind of practice do they offer bariatric uh, procedures pre-abdominal uh, hernia repair. Does anyone care to respond? Yeah. No. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a response at the moment. <laughs> All right, well, I'm, you're not getting off that easily. Let me ask you this. Um, your uh, senior residents or fellows, you do a lot of abdominal wall reconstructions and hernia repairs. Um, what, what kind of patients do you send away and say, um, in our system, uh, uh, you're not a candidate for hernia repair or we need to see, uh, we need to see you uh, losing this much weight or quitting smoking? Is that an expectation uh, of, of the patients? I know you're not the attending, but you'll have seen a lot of these patients. Yeah, we would be looking at anything uh, above BMI of 40. We will ask them to see the dietitian to their primary care physicians and see if they can lose some weight, just to try to improve the outcomes that way. Otherwise, we find that we get a very high recurrence rate for our patients. Thanks. All right, well, let's go to uh, Carolina's Medical Center. Um, obviously, uh, one of the, the leading centers in this country in the world in uh, abdominal wall, complex abdominal wall reconstruction. Um, uh, uh, Todd and uh, Vedra and, and others who are there, um, talk just a couple of things, but a couple of things if you would please, uh, in terms of what patients, uh, to what degree do you uh, want to engage the patients and, and, and uh, feel that they have a sense of responsibility to, to move forward with their care? Um, and, and what are your requirements of the patients pre-op? I've got a couple of others after that, but why don't you start with that? Thank you, Dr. Park and Dr. Belinsky. We're really enjoying your presentation. Um, so uh, we try to have an open, uh, very open discussion with the family and the patient in the room. Uh, we tell them, we try to figure out what their expectations are as far as um, what they're expecting from surgery. So it could be somebody that is wanting to run marathons versus somebody who just wants to uh, have a better function of their abdominal wall. So, um, you know, we don't really turn a lot of patients away. We just kind of tell them what, uh, what to expect perioperatively, and then they will either decide to proceed with surgery, which is the most common thing, or not. Uh, but we definitely try to close their abdominal wall, reapproximate the abdominal wall musculature, like um, Dr. Belinsky was talking about, to get the best function. So, The consideration of otherwise preoperatively, uh, I expect the patients to to take accountability for themselves. Uh, I, I'm very honest with them, I'm very blunt with them about, about smoking, much, what, much like uh, uh, Igor mentioned. We won't operate on someone to a abdominal reconstruction unless they stop smoking, and the data is clear. They need to stop smoking for at least three weeks, and we, we, we choose for four weeks, and we'll check a urine cotein level on them, and if it's positive, we'll cancel their operation the day of surgery. Otherwise, the consideration is much like what Phil said. Not only do we decrease the recurrence rate if a patient loses weight, but we have excellent data in more than 500 patients that Paul Calavita collected and consecutive patients demonstrating that weight loss actually decreases the risk of infection. And every, every tick you can make on uh, body mass index is important. Uh, Mike Rosen's data, that, which is unpublished, which is coming out in the annals of surgery, also echoes that. The other considerations is diabetes. Patients who, have, who, patients who are diabetic you know, we check in hemoglobin A1C is, is one of the things we're doing now, and a hemoglobin less than, eight, less than six, A1C less than six is terribly important. And we're also discovering, too, much like is found in the data, that patients who claim they're not diabetic actually are. And checking hemoglobin A1C in patients who look to be like they could be diabetic also is important. Checking for MRSA uh, and treating those patients prior to surgery and just making sure that patients have good hygiene prior to surgery also is all of these things directly impact outcomes and we are becoming more and more stringent, and we're making patients take accountability for themselves. If they won't, we won't operate on them. I mean, if you have complications, much like Igor has described, we found that just wound complications in our hospital, in hospital cost is about $35,000, and that's unacceptable when those things can be mitigated by the patient taking responsibility. Thanks, uh, thanks both of you. Uh, great comments, and I, th I think this is such an important uh, discussion, and and this this concept we've learned from our colleagues in the bariatric surgical world the importance of patients hitting milestones, and and we're we're a little bit late to the to the game, uh, I think, in, in, in 
holding to the same kind of accountability in the um, abdominal wall reconstruction domain. Thank, thank you very much. Great comments. Um, Igor, can you continue? Last segment. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the comments. Uh, I think uh, when uh, talking about abdominal wall reconstruction, I think it's, it's nice when somebody shows you a before and after picture and uh, it looks very nice, but I think it's important to follow the outcomes. Uh, there's one study that published uh, Nabitsky uh, in the Journal of American College of Surgeons 2006, looking at 128 patients who underwent uh, open retinal ventral hernia repair from 2001 to 2005. Uh, here's a patient characteristics. Uh, the average age was 47, 64% of them were female. The average BMI was 39. Uh, here are the comorbidities, heart disease, pulmonary disease, diabetes, steroid use, smoking. The, in childhood outcomes, the average uh, upper thumb was 221 minutes, the average blood loss was 176 cc's, average mesh size was 937 centimeters squared, and 44% of the patients had abdominal plastic. There were no major intraoperative events. Complications were seen in 15.6 patients, uh, uh, such as pulmonary, urinary tract infection, trans uh, ATN, and DVT. There were no mortalities, and length of stay was 4.8 days. Uh, the median follow was 24 months and the recurrence rate was 3.1%. Uh, we've seen, uh, yeah, um, obviously, we're collaborating with Carolina's Medical Center, and I, I just know that uh, since then uh, they had about 700 more patients that, and uh, right now it's in published data and we'll be presenting soon. But uh, let me tell you, the numbers as far as outcomes are very similar. Uh, but one thing about, as uh, Dr. Hanford mentioned, uh, was uh, abdominal wall construction. One major complication is. Uh, uh, wound complications. Postoperative wound infection actually is a major risk factor for the recurrence. Uh, as mentioned, the contributing factors uh, from multivariate analysis is uh, smoking and postoperative seroma formation. Uh, for smoking, as mentioned before, I will not operate on those patients. Bottom line. Uh, for seroma, we learn how to control that. Uh, again, uh, typically uh, what we've been doing is just placing subcutaneous drains and the drains will stay in there. Uh, for six to eight weeks sometimes because we do raise this uh, very large uh, subcutaneous flaps. What we've started doing now recently is uh, using talc. And uh, here's a video of uh, intraoperative uh, aerosolized talc. Uh, the midline fascia is closed. The system is raising the flaps. And then all you do is uh, each one of those cans has four grams of talc. We just spray four grams of talc subcutaneously. Uh, David Klima, resident of Carolina, is uh, reporting that and you've seen that, showing that there's decrease in cell lives, decrease in wound infections, decrease in uh, uh, duration of how long they have down uh, the subcutaneous drain stay in place. It really uh, works. I do this in every single one of my patients who I develop subcutaneous collapsing. Now, uh, now uh, this all, we're always going to be tackling as hernia surgeons the recurrence rates, the infections. But I think quality of life is really becoming one of the most important things, and as far as also functionality is becoming very important in what we do. Um, there's not a lot of literature out there about when they're talking about component separation and quality of life. Again, uh, David Klima, he's doing a lot of uh, publishing a lot of literature on uh, uh, bell work constructions, and uh, this is a re recent publication, Quality of Life Following Component Separation versus Standard Open Metro Hernia Repair for Large Hernias. Uh, which is that he has looked at two groups of patients, uh, those that uh, uh, need an open uh, ventral hernia without component separations and those that uh, need uh, uh, open ventral hernia with component separations. Uh, the significance of that is we do not know what uh, component separations do to quality of life. Well, uh, this paper showed that, that there was no difference in quality of life uh, between uh, the two methods of repair. They were a little bit higher. Uh, risks of wound complications uh, when forming uh, component separations because you do raise uh, septi uh, larger subcutaneous flaps to mobilize the midline fascia back together. But more importantly, also they uh, look uh, they use the CCS, CCS Carolina's Comfort Scale uh, to look from before and after as far as quality of life goes uh, before component separation and after component separation in those patients. And they saw that pain, movement limitation, now overall quality of life has significantly improved long term after component separations were uh, performed. So uh, what is the importance of approximating linear alba? Again, uh, I think more and more surgeons started to think of it, a linear alba as a tendon, and it desires a certain degree of tension uh, when bringing it back together. Uh, back in 1989, Emerson the Elder report midline closure acts as an anchor for lateral abdominal wall. Uh, there's an interesting study by Dan Hartog, uh, which uh, uh, used the Biodex 4 system to measure the torque in the abdominal wall. What they've done is they've looked at the patients that had uh, uh, laparoscopic bridging repair where the midline fascia was left open versus the 
uh, repair that had the, prior, the fascia closed primarily. And uh, they actually uh, did see trends, see this table down here below, did see trends uh, of uh, more torque being generated uh, in, by, uh, in, by the, in the cord and by the export system uh, by the primary closure patients versus the ones that had laparoscopic fusion repair. Again, there was trends, it was not statistically significant, the P was 0 0.86, but they did not have a lot of patients. Um, what do we have out there to measure functionality? There's, uh, here's a couple of instruments. Uh, there's uh, the Bowers Group out of uh, Florida. Uh, they're uh, doing double leg lowering, trunk raising, and supine reaching, and they essentially give a point system before the surgery and after the surgery to their patients. Uh, also published, uh, the Gunner, uh, uh, Gunnarsson and colleagues published uh, uh, their experience uh, with a uh, Biodex System 4. Again, that's uh, essentially a machine that measures the torque. It's a little cumbersome, but it's uh, very reliable. Uh, that, so what is the future work right now? So uh, I think most important, uh, it's always gonna, we're always going to be focusing on decreasing occurrence, uh, decreasing mesh of infection. If anyone knows uh, ideal mesh out there, please tell me, I'll start using it. Um, with infection and breakdown, it's, uh, we're doing a lot of work uh, on it right now, to trying to figure out how to decrease it even more. But I think really quality of life and uh, uh, the restoring functionality is going to be really the next area uh, of your research where a lot more work is going to be coming, in, uh, coming through. One thing I want to comment about functionality is that you know, it may not be as easy as just doing sit-ups, you know, because as mentioned before by some of the other people who commented, some of the patients are you know, 75 year old female who all she wants to do is be able to cook and uh, get a can of soup from the top shelf of, uh, in her kitchen. And you know, she's not going to be doing those sit-ups. So really, uh, do we man, you know, how do we man, truly measure functionality? It might be a little bit more complicated. So I think in the future, it may, may be a combination of quality of life together with functionality. But we do need to learn more about the functionality of down wall because we're doing all those procedures. We're freely cutting muscles, uh, to, to doing the point separation to bring the midline fascia back together. But really, I think completely don't understand how it affects the functionality long term. I think it'd be interesting to in the future to look more at it and how it relates to the quality of life. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Igor. Just a, a couple of comments I want to go around for uh, as we conclude here. Let's go back to our uh, colleagues at, at Walter uh, Reed um, at National Military Medical Center. Uh, and I just want to put the question, you'd spoken uh, earlier uh, about the importance in your patient population of reestablishing core um, function to help them ambulate uh, and uh, et cetera. Are there any ways that you do this? Are there any are there any metrics that you use now to, to look at that uh, pre or post op or certainly post op? Uh, that's a great question. Again, great uh, presentation, Igor. Appreciate it. And uh, just to follow up on my initial uh, comments, when we do the component part separation on these uh, wounded warriors at the final stage, we do place an underlay mesh in, in all the patients. Um, the answer is we have a lot of metrics that they measure with regards to the amputees and their rehabilitation. But uh, uh, based on this uh, VTC, uh, the point of you know, following the core musculature and the functionality after that, I think that's a great issue and, and we're gonna look into being able to do that in our uh, legacy patients who we've done these procedures on. Thank you, thanks. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I think, again, for all the, the young surgeons in the audience and the fellows uh, looking for some, some research project opportunities, I think this is very, uh, uh, fertile ground. Uh, go for a final comment to uh, Carolina's Medical Center. Uh, again, um, any uh, comment on um, on the? Uh, I, I know you guys have really um, led in the in the idea of assessing quality uh, from the patient's perspective in terms of uh, crafting hernia repairs. Uh, what about assessing function? Uh, as we just kind of heard the last few slides that I, that Igor presented. So quality and function, what, what are you guys thinking about and how are you kind of positioning uh, not just your clinical um, practice now, but even uh, research questions that you're looking at along these lines? Thanks, Adrian. I, I think that uh, much like you said, this is fertile ground. And if you and I can think back to 15 years ago when we were talking about laparoscopic ventral hernia repair and our traditional measures of success was purely recurrence. And then we moved to pain and now we're talking about function. Some of the questions that Igor raised uh, early on in, the, in the, the studies that he quoted, looking at the, the recruitment of transversalis muscle, we had no idea about this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and, and wouldn't have understood it if we had. And the, the, we are light years beyond 
uh, where, where we were. And even the consideration now in the future of which muscles you would cut to release the abdominal wall, which fascia layers you would cut, you know, like the recruitment of transversalis, should we, should we be doing TAR procedures now? Because transversalis obviously is so important in, even in, in forced expiration, but also just in breathing. Should we go, just go to the external oblique? There's so much to learn in this. So it's not only what the patients want and what their functional status is, but also the consideration of just breathing. And I think that you know, being realistic with the patient is terribly important. And we are indeed, much like the paper that Dave Klima uh, published recently in your journal, uh, we are very interested in, in pain. We're interested in, in, in the mesh itself and also how those interact and, and allow patients to do what they, what they want to do. But it needs to be individualized, much like what Igor said. Great. Uh, thanks very much for those uh, comments. Well, as we uh, conclude uh, this, uh, this program, I want to thank uh, Igor Belinsky very much for a, for a very cogent uh, um, and, and uh, really uh, insightful presentation and for all uh, the comments uh, that we had uh, from around the country and around the world. Thank you very much.